Professor Mamet. Yes. Poon, Professor Yeo, Professor Jong. Ladies and gentlemen joining us here today and online, good afternoon. On behalf of the Chinese University of Hong Kong Press and the Institute of Health Equity CUHK, I would like to welcome everyone to today's program. This is a very special day for us as we celebrate the official launch of the Chinese edition of Professor Mahmoud's The Health Gap. I'm sure everyone here is anticipating the insightful sharing from Professor Mahmoud. Apart from that, we'll also hear from Professor E.K. Yeo, co-director of the IHE CUHK on the latest development in Hong Kong. Health inequality is a pressing issue that affects every one of us. With the presentation of our two speakers and the publication of the health gap in Chinese, it is hoped that today's program would bring a new perspective to the discourse of inequality and public health. We are honored to have Professor Robert Yu, Vice Chancellor and President of the CHK, as the officiating guest of today's program. May I now invite Professor Tun to speak a few words for us. Professor Tun, please. Professor Sir Michael Marmot, fellow colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. The famous American columnist and author Thomas Friedman once declared in his highly popular book that the world is flat. On the other hand, Professor Marmot tells us, no, it is not. The world is not flat precisely because it is not equal. In the world we live in, this unequal world, we can see how social gradient affects our health. The lower the social status of an individual, the worse their health. Professor Mahmoud, a world-renowned expert in clinical epidemiology, has also committed himself to promoting health equity and has been the pioneer of the field over the past several decades. He has championed groundbreaking research and raised awareness of health inequity in different communities around the world. As a result of his work, more and more people are looking at healthcare in a different light. Professor Mahmoud believes that health inequality has little to do with healthcare per se that is healthcare provided by clinicians. On the other hand, the crux of the problem lies in social factors beyond healthcare, and that is where we should turn our attention and resources to. Some have argued that the issue is too big and we cannot change the status quo. Therefore, we have very little responsibility to address the social factors that deprive people of good health. But Professor Marmot's own experience and his book will tell us that this is in fact far from the truth. The term social determinants of health has already become a hot topic in the field of public health and social science in recent years. However, it is still rather obscure beyond academia, especially in the Chinese speaking community. One likely reason for this is the fact that publications on this subject have yet to be translated into Chinese. Therefore, I am very proud that the Chinese University of Hong Kong is playing an important part in the discussion. By translating Professor Marmot's monumental work, The Health Gap, The Challenge of an Unequal World into Chinese, the CUHK Press actively continues its mission in disseminating knowledge around the world to Chinese readers, both in the academic field and beyond. Looking back, 
the seed of the project was planted more than three years ago. In 2018, at my suggestion and invitation, Professor Mohammed visited CUHK and delivered a scintillating lecture on health equity and sustainable development, and has since then played a major role in setting up the Institute of Health Equity in CUHK. In 2020, the Institute was established, being the very first of its kind in Asia. Professor Mahmoud currently serves as co-director of the Institute with Professor Jean Wu and Professor E.K. Yao of CUHK. In June 2020, the Institute of Health Equity held an online forum entitled Social Determinants of Health Inequality. What are the lessons of COVID-19 in Hong Kong and around the world? This was followed by a number of related activities. For example, the webinar in November 2020, How Does the COVID-19 Pandemic Induce Health Inequalities? These activities have highlighted the studies by Professor Roger Chung, Associate Director of the Institute, which delineate the severity of health inequality in Hong Kong and describe how these pre-existing conditions were exacerbated under the COVID-19 pandemic. Health inequality is assuredly not an abstract concept. It is indeed affecting every one of us. In fact, during the pandemic, all are at risk when some are at risk. As Professor Mahmoud mentioned in, his, in, in this book, government, knowledge, academia, and the people get the three working together and we can move mountains. In a global crisis as devastating as the pandemic, I believe we must critically reflect upon the current parameters that are used to assess the quality of health care, including its delivery, availability, affordability, and responsiveness. It is high time that we take this opportunity to build a more equal and accommodating society for all. No, we must not let a serious crisis go to waste. So Michael's book will indeed not only describe the playing field, but also important pointers for the game plan itself. Finally, I would like to thank every one of you for attending the book launch today for Sir Michael's opus, AKA, The Health Gap, The Challenge of an Unequal World. Of course, my deepest gratitude goes to the CU Press and the CUHK Institute of Health Equity for making this possible. I wish you all good health and a wonderful afternoon and evening. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jun, for your kind remarks. May I now invite Ms. Gan Chi, Director of CHA Press, to say a few words. Director Gan, please. Dear Professor Marmot, our author, Dear Vice Chancellor, our preface writer, dear fellow colleagues of the CUHK community, from the U university admin, from the Institute of Health Equity, and from all other departments and units. Dear distinguished guests from Hong Kong SARS Department of Health, from Hong Kong non-governmental organizations such as Health in Action, and Hong Kong Council of Social Services. Dear respected Hong Kong media professionals, please allow me to pay special respects to the journalists and editors of Ming Bao, who just published a two full-page in-depth report in Sunday's newspapers. 
dear translator, editors, designers, publicists, marketing and sales colleagues of this book, dear reader, both online and present here today. I'm aware that this greeting list sounds a little bit long, but I also believe this list could never be too long if only time permits, because the challenge of pursuing health equity is a huge comprehensive job, sometimes a depressing job, demanding the collective effort of the entire society and much more difficult than someone simply being a good doctor or a good professor. However, if we all work together, we probably can move mountains. Back to the summer of 2019, I received an email from the VC recommending Professor Marmot's book. Reading through the book from the first chapter, The Organization of Misery, to the 11th and last chapter, The Organization of Hope, we realize is an odyssey, a long and difficult journey full of trials and tribulations, but it is indeed a fundamentally optimistic book. For a professional publisher like us, there is nothing more to say about publishing a quality translation book. We bought a copyright, we found a good Taiwan-based translator with an academic background. We edited it, we did the formatting and the cover design, and we put it into print. Two years passed, and the book is here. I would say that in joining an odyssey, not everyone has to be a hero, but everyone can make a contribution. At the time of this book launch, my colleagues and I are particularly proud of being part of the CUHK that initiated this academic social enterprise in Hong Kong inspired by Professor Marmot and prior to most of our Asian counterparts. We are proud that Hong Kong is in action. For the health and dignity of 99% of the people, including ourselves, unless, you, unless someone here belongs to the 1%. As the cover design, implies most of us are the gray apples at different gradients. Thanks to Professor Marmel for the design inspiration for color gradients, except there is only one red apple. Therefore, we are all working here for the dignity of ourselves, for our children, or for our children's children. Thank you. Thank you, Director Gan. Let us now proceed to the gift presentation and photo taking uh, session. As we are in the book launch of the health gap, what better gift there is than Professor Mahmoud's work? Although we are uh, separated by geography, Professor Mahmoud, uh, he is indeed very close to us. So close that we have prepared a special e-signed edition of the work for our special guests. May I now invite Professor Rocky Tun, Mr. Eric Ng, Mr. Laurie Piercy, Professor Yi K. Yo, and Professor Roger to come forward. Thank you, Director Gan, and every uh, our honored guest. Now, let us proceed to the session that we have all been waiting for. May I now invite Professor Roger Jong, Associate Director of IHE, moderator for today's program, to the presentation table. Professor Jong, please. So, Professor Tuan, VC, 
Sir Michael, Professor Yeo, um, Director Estegan, Professor Wu, um, our fellow colleagues of the COHK community, distinguished guests, our press, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is my greatest pleasure um, to welcome you all to the book launch of the Chinese edition of Professor Marmot's monumental work, The Health Gap, The Challenge of an Unequal World. And I have to do this in Cantonese and Mandarin too. Co-hosted by the CUHK Institute of Health Equity and the CU Press. Sir Michael's groundbreaking writing has transformed our understanding of public health since its publication. Now we will hear from him shortly, and I'm sure we'll know why his book has been so widely circulated and praised. In today's event, we'll also turn our focus to the local context and have Professor E.K. Yeo, co-director of the CUHK Institute of Health Equity and also professor of public health to share the latest findings from our soon to be published and our first Hong Kong's own health equity report. After that, we'll have some time for Q&A. Now, before we start, let me just briefly introduce Professor Sir Michael Marmot again, who actually really needs no introduction, um, but I really have to let everybody know his credentials. Professor Sir Michael Marmot is Professor of Epidemiology at University College London, UCL. He is also Director of the UCL Institute of Health Equity, co-director of the CUHK Institute of Health Equity. He served as former president of the World Medical Association. He has had led research groups of health inequalities for over 40 years. And he chaired the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health in 2005. At the request of the British government, he conducted the strategic review of health inequalities in England post-2010 and published as a report, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, or more commonly known as the Marmot Review in 2010. Sir Michael recently published his observation on COVID-19 in his latest report, Build Back Farah, the COVID-19 Marmot Review also. Sir Michael has been a true pioneer in the field of public health and social epidemiology. His best-selling title, The Health Gap, received raving reviews in academia and beyond. And now that we have the title in Chinese, thanks to the CU Press, I'm sure the book will reach a greater number and wider scope of audience and more readers will be able to share Michael's, Sir Michael's vision. With his eloquent writing, Sir Michael illustrates his message from compelling examples around the world. And that message is, Social injustice is indeed the greatest threat to global health. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Professor Sir Michael Marmot. Thank you very much for both to the Vice Chancellor and to you, Roger, for such eloquent uh, introductions. And indeed, the message that both of you have given is that this is a tractable problem. We do not have to say, oh, it's too difficult. There's nothing we can do. There's a great deal we can do. The opening line, uh, by the way, I'm delighted that it's in Chinese. And the opening line of my book was why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick. The healthcare system is absolutely vital, particularly in times of a pandemic, but it's the conditions that make people sick in the first place, the social determinants of health that exercise me. I write in the health gap about Baltimore in the United States, stark inequalities. And I contrast two people, LaShawn, who's grown up in the Upton Druid Heights neighborhood in Baltimore's inner city, and Bobby, who's grown up in Greater Roland Park in Poplar. The life expectancy in Upton Druid is 63. In Roland Park, 
it's 83, 20-year gap in life expectancy. I was at a meeting at Johns Hopkins, which is in Baltimore, and a couple of young doctors kidnapped me. They said, you cannot sit here in this elegant auditorium. We have to show you Baltimore. So we went to Roland Park, beautiful, leafy Roland Park, and we went to Upton Druid. I was about to talk about this in the United States when Baltimore erupted in mass unrest, gross violence. The spark of the unrest was the killing of a black man by the police, or should I say one more killing of a black man by the police. And when I say Baltimore erupted, that's not quite accurate. It was actually Upton Druid that erupted. All the unrest was in the deprived area, not in leafy Roland Park. Now, I don't think that ill health causes civil unrest, and I don't think civil unrest necessarily is the cause of ill health. But the causes of disadvantage which lead to poor health are also likely to be the same sorts of causes that lead to civil unrest. So what's it like growing up in Upton Druid for LeSean? Half a single parent families, median household income in 2010 was $17,000. So not poor by global standards, not at all. Although as I'll show you in a moment, quite poor by American standards. Four out of 10 were under proficient reading in the third grade, more than 50% missed at least 20 days of high school, 90% did not go on to college. And look at this, each year, a third of young people aged 10 to 17 were arrested for juvenile disorder. A third each year. It means the majority will have a criminal record by age 17. In 2005 to 2009, there were 100 non-fatal shootings for every 10,000 residents and nearly 40 homicides. When these young doctors took me to this area, there were streets where every second house had a diagonal red cross on the door. That diagonal red cross means that those houses were deemed unsafe for human habitation. If there was a fire or other emergency, the emergency services would not go in there. Can you imagine what it's like living in a neighborhood where every second house is condemned as unfit for human habitation? And in leafy Roland Park, 93% two-parent families, median household income, not 17, thousand dollars but ninety thousand dollars 97 percent do well at reading only eight percent miss 20 days remember 90 percent did not go on to college in upton druid in roland park 75 percent complete college juvenile arrests one in 50 each year and no non-fatal shootings four homicides which is a lot but nothing like the 40 homicides in the other part of town. This is dramatic, the difference between the poor and the rich. But exactly as the vice chancellor said in his introduction, health inequalities are not confined to poor health for the poor. These are data from England. This top graph is life expectancy by degree of deprivation of the area. So here you've got the least deprived, they're the most deprived. And you can see people near the top have shorter life expectancy than those at the top. Those in the middle, shorter life expectancy than those near the top, and so on all the way down. From top to bottom, it's a social gradient. The gap between the fifth centile 
and the 95th centaur is seven years. But in fact, there are small areas with much bigger differences, a bit like the 20 years that I showed you in Baltimore. The bottom graph is disability free life expectancy because it's not just length of life that matters, but quality of life. The gradient is steeper. The gap between the fifth centile and the 95th centile is now not seven years, but 17 years. And the gradient's crucial. It means that people in the middle have, on average, eight and a half fewer years of healthy life than people at the top. So the gradient affects all of us. We can't just say, oh, it's the poor. It's all of us below the very top. Now, all societies have stratification. Rich, somewhat rich, fairly rich, middle, lower middle, poor, all societies have social stratification. If health follows this social stratification, you might say, well, there's always going to be health inequalities. What can we do about it? Well, it turns out the magnitude varies enormously. This is life expectancy at age 25 in Europe. ISCED 0 to 2 is primary education. 5 to 6 is tertiary education. SE is Sweden. And you can see that Sweden has a long average life expectancy at age 25. And the gap between those with tertiary education and those with primary education is quite small. Everywhere, there's a gap. But the size of the gap between those with tertiary education, and those with primary education varies enormously. In fact, in these countries, in the former communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe, Estonia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, Croatia, the Czech Republic, the gap is much bigger. Another way of looking at this is the between country difference is much smaller for people with university education. The between country difference is much bigger for people with only primary education. If you think that health is a matter of personal choice, you can choose to behave well or choose not to behave well, then you'd be really silly to choose to have your parents have you born in Estonia. You should choose parents living in Sweden or Italy or Norway or Malta or Denmark. Don't choose to have parents living in Estonia or Hungary or Romania. But if you do make such a silly choice, make sure you choose to go to university <laughs> because that will reduce the chasm between East and West. So the magnitude of the gradient varies enormously between countries. And that should give us grounds for optimism because if it can vary, it's not a fixed property of complex societies. And it can vary over time. In England, this is the life expectancy gap between the 20% most deprived areas and in fact, it's not the average, it's the other 80%. And from 1983 to 2003, for males and females, the gap was increasing. Life expectancy inequalities were getting bigger. New Labour was elected in 1997, and they had a strategy to reduce health inequalities. Not much happened for the first few years after 97, because it takes a while to develop the strategy to implement it. But over the period 2004 to 2012, the gap got smaller. The difference in life expectancy between the most deprived 20% and the rest diminished. Wow, you can make a difference then. New Labour was voted out, 
conservative-led coalition government came in. It took a while to change everything, but they did. And the gap got bigger again. So it can vary between countries and it can vary over time within a country. And as I said, that should give us grounds for optimism. And in the United States, interestingly, uh, infant mortality has been coming down over time. There's a downward trend. And this is deviation from that trend, depending on who was in the White House. When LBJ Johnson was in the White House, it didn't deviate much. When Nixon and Ford, the downward trend was less. The deviation, there was bigger infant mortality than you would have predicted from the downward trend. When Carter was in the White House, the downward trend got bigger. When Reagan and Bush Sr., the downward trend got smaller. Clinton, the downward trend got bigger. George W. was bad for infant mortality. Obama was good. Wow, it looks like who's in the White House really matters for the health of the population, but it can vary over time. Why has Hong Kong done well? I don't know. And in fact, the reason we set up the Chinese University of Hong Kong Institute of Health Equity was in a way to answer that question. And I did that was before I wrote the health gap, so I don't deal with it. We'll hear a bit more from Professor Yeo a bit later. But a link question is, why has the USA done badly? There's Hong Kong, this is life expectancy. And there's the United States. Wow, falling way. In fact, the US is behind Cuba. Uh, it's good to have the Russian Federation on this graph because it makes people in America not feel too badly about themselves. <laughs> At least Russia's worse. And as I say in the health gap, go into a typical American school and count 100 boys age 15. 13 of you will fail to reach your 60th birthday. Is 13 out of 100 a lot? The US risk is double the Swedish risk, which is less than seven. In fact, 49 other countries rank better than the United States. That's really interesting and really important. It's not just about how rich the country is. This is a version of the Preston curve for the Americas. If you look at gross domestic product per capita, adjusting for, pur for purchasing power and expectancy on the axis, Haiti is a very poor country. If Haiti got as rich as Bolivia, which is not saying much, it's quite likely life expectancy would improve. If Bolivia got as rich as Brazil, it's quite likely that their life expectancy would improve. At low levels of national income, there's a steep relation between national income and life expectancy. But when you get up to the level of Costa Rica, Cuba, Chile, and go all the way out to the United States, there's simply no relation between national income and life expectancy. For a country to get healthy, getting richer is not the solution. Once you get up above around $20,000 GDP per person, adjusting for purchasing power. Canada has lower GDP than the US, but longer life expectancy, significantly longer. What determines where you are in terms of life expectancy is much more to do with the social determinants of health. And the US, we know, spends 17% of its GDP on healthcare. It's not primarily due to healthcare. In the health gap, I go through the life course. 
starting with early life and giving every child the best start in life. In chapter eight, I tell the story of Mary and I'll read from the book now, from chapter eight. And you could show the Chinese translation. In May 2011, Mary hanged herself. She was found in the yard of her grandparents' house on a First Nations reserve in the province of British Columbia in Canada. She was 14. She was a First Nations Aboriginal Canadian. Her story has particulars. All suicides do. She'd been physically and emotionally abused at her home and in her community and possibly sexually abused. Her mother was mentally unstable and heard voices telling her to snap her child's head. Officials attributed the suicide to a dysfunctional child welfare system and to the fact that no one took her complaints of, of abuse seriously or acted on them. There is another way to look at Mary's sadly foreshortened life. And that is to realize that though her personal tragedy was unique, there are many young Aboriginal Canadians who experience similar tragedies. In fact, the Aboriginal youth suicide rate in British Columbia is five times the average for all young Canadians. One cannot understand fully why Mary saw no way out without also asking why so many other young Aboriginal people in British Columbia reached the same desperate point. If I may have the slides back, thank you. Heavens. Researchers in British Columbia pointed to the fact that there was this very high rate of Aboriginal youth suicide, but there were about 200 different bands of First Nation Canadians in British Columbia. And the rate of suicide varied enormously among the different bands. And they classified the groups of First Nation Aboriginal Canadians by two cultural factors, self-government and participation in land claim and community control of health services, education, cultural facilities, and police and fire services. And the, so six criteria, the more of these six present, the lower the Aboriginal youth suicide. For those that had all of them, there were no suicides. For those that had none, the suicide rate by 100,000 was 140. So yes, Mary's story has particulars, but cultural cohesion, community control and empowerment made a huge difference to whether young people felt the need to take their own lives. And we know that adverse childhood experiences are extremely damaging. Early sex, for people who had four or more adverse childhood experiences, if you could reduce it, you could reduce early sex by a third, unintended teenage pregnancy by 38%, smoking, binge drinking, cannabis use. Look at this, half the perpetrators of domestic violence had four or more adverse childhood experiences. And even more chilling, half the victims of domestic violence had four or more adverse childhood experiences. Next, I talk about education. PISA is the Program of International Student Assessment. Young people age 15 or 16 are given standardized tests, and this is mathematics. And there's an economic and social classification system 
socioeconomic position. So Finland does the best in Europe. And you can see the higher the social position, the better they do. The UK, our most privileged 25%, don't do as well as the Finns, but we have a steeper gradient. So our least privileged 25% do a lot worse than the Finns. In the US, they're best off, don't do even as well as the UK, let alone Finland, and they have a steep gradient. So their bottom 25% do very badly. Here's Macau, China, and I think Hong Kong looks rather like Macau uh, with a very shallow social gradient. And that looks good for the future. Fair employment and good work for all. We know about physical hazards in the workplace, but stress in the workplace increases the risk of disease. Let me read from chapter six. And if you take over, thank you. Alan was a picker in a vast warehouse. You order goods online. Alan goes to the shelf where they are stored, picks them, places them in a trolley, takes them to the packer who puts them in a box, sticks on a label, and you have them a couple of days later. It's so neat. You click, he picks, she packs and sticks. It's convenient for you, less so for Alan. Alan was a picker. He was fired for collecting three penalty points, which he explained to me when we met as part of the BBC Panorama program. When on nights, a typical shift lasted 10 and a half hours, punctuated by two 15 minute breaks and one half hour break, that is nine and a half hours of work. On arrival for his shift, Alan was handed what was in effect his controller and conscience, a handheld electronic device that directed him to row X to pick up item Y and put it in his trolley. Then to row P to pick up item Q and so on. When his trolley contained about 250 grams, 250 kilograms, his device would direct Alan to the packers. Then he'd be off again for another load. His target was 110 large items an hour, more for smaller items, two a minute. That was the job for nine and a half hours, plus the hour of breaks. His handheld electronic gizmo was not just his controller, it also fed back what he had done. So his performance could be monitored to see how he did against his target. He was warned when he did not keep up the pace. If he fell too far behind, he would incur half a penalty point, more a whole point. Did you ever, I asked Alan, in all the time you worked there, meet your target and finish a shift with a sense of achievement? Not once was his answer, hour after hour, day after day, and feeling always that he had fallen short. My reaction to Alan's experience, that it was as if his employers had taken everything we know about damaging aspects of work, concentrated them in a syringe, and in and injected them into Alan. Added to the heavy physical demands, Alan's work was characterized by high demand with no control over the work task, by high effort and little reward, by social isolation at work, by job insecurity, by organizational injustice, and by shift work. All of which, as I lay out in the book, have been shown to damage health. Wow. 
Could I have the screen back, please? As I say, there's a great deal of evidence showing that the type of work to which Alan was subject is bad for health. In our Whitehall 2 study of British civil servants, we measured isostrain, social isolation, no, no supportive co-workers or supervisors, and high strain, high demands, and low control. It increases risk of heart disease. One of the ways it does that is to increase the risk of the metabolic syndrome, which we think is related to insulin resistance. The more occasions that people were exposed to isostrain, the greater the risk of the metabolic syndrome, which increases risk of diabetes and of cardiovascular disease. And again, if you could show the text for Lalta, I say, if you think that Alan had it bad, let me tell you about Lalta. Lalta was a human scavenger. Her occupation and that of a million or so others like her in India was to clean human excrement out of dry latrines by hand, pile it in a reed basket, carry it on her head to a dumping place and deposit it. Can you imagine a line of work more foul? Lalta couldn't either. As she said, quote, all I missed was my dignity. I felt like the dirt. I carried on my head, unquote. Lalta lived in Alwa in Rajasthan in India, but she might have been in one of several states. Most of the, the latrines built in India in the 20th century were of the dry type, largely because of water shortage. The tradition of this most demeaning of work was passed down through Dalit outcast families for centuries, or in Lalta's case, she married into it at age 17. Parenthetically, about one sixth of India's vast population are Dalit outcast. There are a lot of people in demeaning occupations. The scavengers had to reach in through a tunnel and retrieve the human waste by hand. The problem with work like Lalta's is a double burden, as well as the physical and biological hazards. There is the gross lack of dignity, the threat to self-worth, the appalling stress of such an occupation. Lalta felt there was no way out. She was told this was her fate. Not that there was calm acceptance of it. And I quote, there was no happiness in our lives. It actually had no meaning. All the time, it was either people's filth on the head or it's th thought in the heart, unquote. This is me now. I have never been more impressed by toilets than when I heard someone from Sulab International, a non-governmental organization set up to deal with this issue, describe what happened next. Lalta herself could not solve her problems but an organization could. There were two parts to the solution. Sulab International installed low-cost safe sanitation systems in villages, public toilets replaced dry latrines. Villages had to, to pay a small cost to use the public toilets so that the enterprise of installing toilets paid for itself. Since 1970, Sulab International has installed more than 1.4 million household toilets and maintains more than 6,500 public pay-per-use facilities. They even set up an international museum of toilets. 
more interested in people than in porcelain. I'm inspired by what happened to the scavengers in the area where Sulab had been working. They were retrained. In the case study I was shown, they were retrained as beauticians. A wonderful image. Instead of toiling beneath the surface of human dignity, dealing with the waste we would all rather not acknowledge, they were working to enhance others' dignity and their own by working to help women look more beautiful. Pictures of these graceful former scavengers in white saris gladden the heart. Other scavenger women have also been trained to make pickles, have various jobs in food processing, do office jobs, and have received microcredits for small businesses. Lalta saw her pay go from 600 rupees a month to 2,000 rupees. More, she says, and I quote, from a heap of humiliation to the height of self-respect and self-confidence, I believe life has turned out miraculously for the good. I don't ask for more, for today I can stand and face the world with respect, unquote. And when I hear people in rich countries lament appalling work or living conditions with no apparent way out, I remind them of Lalta and people like her in demeaning work all over the world and the power of group action and vision to transform people's lives. It's worth bearing in mind as we examine the evidence on work and health that if the working conditions of India's scavengers can be improved by concerted action, all working conditions can be improved wherever we find them. Could I have the screen back, please? Visiting India and other parts of the world, I developed an eye problem. My eyes water at embarrassing moments. The Self-Employed Women's Association in Ahmedabad in Gujarat is dealing with people not quite doing what Lalta was doing, but the poorest, most marginal women in India. And I was given insight into the vegetable sellers in Ahmedabad. They sit in the street with a dirty rag in front of them and a small pile of vegetables all day. They were being ripped off by loan sharks. They have to borrow money to buy food from the growers, the farmers, and having to pay extortionate interest rates. So SEVA, the Self-Employed Women's Association, started a bank to lend these women money. The wholesalers were gouging the growers, paying them very little for their vegetables, and then selling them on to the retailers at vast prices and making a huge profit. So Seva became a wholesaler, a middlewoman, so that they could buy, re pay reasonable prices to the growers, make a small profit, and pass it on to the retailers. They were being harassed by the police and the Self-Employed Women's Association said, under no circumstances should you pay the bribe. We will pursue to the Supreme Court of India the legal right for you to sell your vegetables. They were sitting in the monsoon rains and the burning sun with their children. Savers started childcare. The women get sick. Saver started healthcare. I'll show you about housing in a moment. And then now they've started a pension scheme. Sir, Sir Michael, um, yep. so this is Roger here. I'm sorry um, because I was reminded by um, Sear Press that um, you know we have kind of lost track of the time because of how great the content is. Um, but um, because you know the <laughs> um, we're we're a little bit over time, so. 
maybe you can speed up a little bit. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry about this. Apology. In the so, I, I will. Um, so one case study, they wanted to improve the basic physical infrastructure within the slums. They got upgrading of the slums for only $500 per household. The women had to contribute $50, which is a great deal if you're on $1.90 a day. This is what the slum area looked like before the upgrading. And this is what it looked like after. Wow, makes a difference to people's lives. So I will skip over this. Um, ill health prevention. This is not just about telling people to behave well. Let me give you the example of obesity in the United States. So a BMI greater than 30, greater than or equal to 30, or overweight, the 30 pounds are overweight for a person of that height. And the darker the color, the greater the prevalence of obesity, 10 to 14%, less than 10%. That's 1985. 1997, more than 20% obese, 2010. Wow. You can't think about obesity as people simply not listening to good advice. How do you go from there to there? It's a change in the environment, in the food supply, it's not simply about individual behaviors. And what we see, this is for Europe, the lower the education, the higher the level of obesity. There's the social gradient. As was said, I finished the book with talking about the organization of hope. We had the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, the Marmot Review in England, a European review, a review in the Americas. And this year we published Build Back Fairer in the Eastern Mediterranean region. And I was invited to do the Marmot Review, which we published follows, follow ups of. And our latest in the UK was Build Back Fairer, the COVID 19 Marmot Review. Build back fairer. As we emerge from the pandemic, we should not be wishing simply to reestablish the status quo, but to build back fairer. I finish the book with do something, do more, do better. If we're talking about the self employed women in India, do something. It'll make a difference to their lives. If we're talking about people who have all the basics, do more. And if we're talking about rich countries, we can always do better. And let me finish with this. A well being approach can be described as enabling people to have the capabilities they need to live lives of purpose, balance, and meaning for them. Where might I have got that quote from? Amartya Sen, philosopher and economist, who I quote in the book. No, this was the New Zealand Ministry of Finance. It's quite possible for a government to say, we want to take a well-being approach, enabling people to have the capabilities they need to live lives of purpose, balance, and meaning for them. My message is, that whether the action is at individuals, families, communities, cities and regions, countries, or globally, there is a huge amount we can do to address the social determinants of health and create greater health equity. Thank you very much, Sir Michael. Thank you very much, Sir Michael. A wonderful, wonderful talk. You have me in tears again. Um, it's not that I haven't read the book before, but you know, when you mentioned the story of Lalta, it really literally put me into tears to and remind me why, you know, I and 
other colleagues of us at the Institute of Health Equity are doing this work. It's very important work. And I'm very glad that you also mentioned about Baltimore experience because I, I was in Baltimore from 2001 to 2005 at Johns Hopkins. I graduated in 2005. And I remember when I was um, at the main campus, which they call the Homewood campus, um, I also did, I major in public health at the main campus, at the Homewood campus, and then a minor um, music at the Peabody Conservatory of the Johns Hopkins University. And every time that I have to travel to um, the Peabody Conservatory, I have to take a bus, which is a very you know high security kind of bus. And we were never advised to set foot on some of the streets, you know, um, ghettos, so to speak. But every single time I pass by, you know, on the way to Peabody Conservatory, I look out the window because I could never set foot on them. And I'm always fascinated by, you know, how run down those places are and that there are only two restaurants that I could see, and you can take a guess which two. They start with an M <laughs> and a K. <laughs> so I think this is really social determinants of health um, as we witness it. So thank you very much, Sir Michael, for um, the very, very great talk and, um, and sorry for cutting you short. Um, it is really fascinating. Um, because now we have to turn our attention to the situation in Hong Kong. Um, our Institute of Health Equity conducted extensive research to examine socioeconomic inequalities in health in Hong Kong, um, also with UCL Institute of Health Equity. And in the following session, we'll have um, Professor E.K. Yeo, one of our co-directors, to share part of our findings. Um, in addition to being co-director of the Institute, he's also professor of public health and former director of the School of Public Health and Primary Care of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And he has extensive um, experience as an administrator in the healthcare sector in Hong Kong and beyond. He served as the Secretary for Health, Welfare and Food of the Government of Hong Kong as SAR between 1999 and 2004. He was also the head and the first chief executive of the Hong Kong Hospital Authority from 1990 to 1999. Recently, he has turned his focus on system response to COVID-19, as well as the health inequalities that are being exposed and amplified by the pandemic. So now, without further ado, let us hear from Professor E.K. Yeo. So Michael, uh, Vice Chancellor, Jean, uh, Roger, it's a great uh, privilege uh, to present briefly, I think, to, today, because I think we we'll, don't want to take the thunder off uh, from Sir Michael's presentation, but just to update you the work that we've been doing, inspired by Sir Michael's work, uh, and uh, under the leadership of uh, the Vice Chancellor who has set up the Institute, to report to you briefly of our report of health inequality in Hong Kong. So today we're not going to present the findings. It will be another session later, but with a special focus on the equity impact of COVID-19. So this is our first health equity report. It will be launched uh, very soon. Uh, and you can see that from, from uh, what Sir Michael said, we have really very good life experience for men and women in Hong Kong. So men expect to live uh, over the age of 82. And women expect to live uh, until the age of over 80, 87. Of course, this doesn't then tell you, uh, it, 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 doesn't, it hides the inequalities uh, in, in health. When you look at the uh, social gradient between income and self-rated health, you can see that for, for people with uh, lower incomes, about half of them uh, report their health as poor or fair, whereas people with high incomes, only about 20% do the same. And this is really familiar with you in terms of some of the array of social determinants which are closely related to health, socioeconomic positioning, uh, work conditions, which uh, Sir Michael talked about. Housing in Hong Kong, as we know, is very poor housing. Many people are, are homeless. We have people in subdivided flats. Uh, aging is a problem because we don't have income re re retirement protection. Healthcare access for um, primary care is, is uh, limited. And our, our primary care system is pro-rich because people can't afford uh, the 
especially with people with chronic disease, private healthcare. Although we, we have very good services in Hong Kong, but people cannot access them. Of course, in, social inclusion is a problem, especially for migrant workers and for, um, uh, for ethnic minorities. So when we look at our government responses to COVID-19, obviously there were containing measures that we are familiar with, the social distancing measures, the restrictions that were placed on ourselves, the vaccination programs now. Of course, there were measures done by the government in terms of uh, uh, the hospital services and many of the social services had to be adjusted because of COVID. Uh, there were many containment measures had a lot of unintended consequences on social terms of health, especially for the least advantage. And government was very good in terms of having a very comprehensive fiscal stimulus package. However, uh, if, if you remember, some of this uh, didn't actually go into the people that needed them. Of course, there were also quite very large variations in terms of the business and individuals supported. So government tried to do a hard job. And of course, there were gaps in, in the provision. Uh, there were a wide range of initiatives, but so there were a lot of unmet health and social needs, uh, which uh, remained in the community uh, that, that, uh, as a result of that. Of course, the, uh, the um, civil society was very good in terms of supporting uh, the in terms of both control and mitigation measures. So some of the inequalities exposed by COVID-19 in Hong Kong, uh, there was an impact on the uh, infection itself. Uh, we, we found infection delays, uh, diagnostic delays, and poorer outcomes in poorer, in poorer mental health in disadvantaged uh, populations. These large groups were also disproportionately affected in financial security, employment, education, access to health and social care. So as you can imagine, that 65% of the most deprived compared to 30% of the most deprived felt uh, worried about the financial situation. 60% Six, of the unemployed compared to less than one third in other occupation groups expressed the same concern. There's a strong impact of school closure on child developments. There were higher psychosocial risks in children from low income families and with special needs. And there's also the challenge of a uh, digital divide because a lot of this was uh, teaching from, from home. Uh, and 70% of low-income families did not have computers and 28% had no broadband access. So the, obviously it affected the education. Employment, uh, so unemployment obviously and unemployment was, was, a, was a big problem in, in COVID, but it was uh, affected people unequally. Younger age groups tend to be harder hit and certain occupations, especially um, the more vulnerable occupations, were hardest hit. Access to healthcare. Uh, the, the equitable COVID-19 got worse uh, in our pro-rich outpatient care, as I mentioned. Uh, public non-emergency and non-essential outpatient services were greatly reduced. It was very difficult to manage chronic conditions and mental health with disadvantage. There were more severe COVID-19 outcomes in multi-morbid uh, patients, living in disadvantaged areas. People living in public rental housing and living areas with low education were associated with longer time to diagnosis in the first wave. So people living in those uh, areas had a longer time in terms of diagnosis uh, from time to symptoms to diagnosis of uh, COVID. Uh, the risk of delayed diagnosis uh, was mitigated by high density of public uh, clinics and uh, healthcare. Access to social care was uh, severely compromised because many of the center-based services were severely affected. So a lot of the home care services, support for carers, uh, a lot of the rehabilitative services were either suspended or severely uh, curtailed. Uh, there were online services that the social work tried to do, but they faced constraints, both in terms of familiarity of both the staff and of users in terms of the ability to launch some of these services. There was also a lot of exclusion and discrimination towards marginalized groups, ethnic minorities, migrants, foreign domestic workers. In fact, they, they, they reported difficult to access health information in the language, discriminatory behaviors and employment conditions. So many of the migrant workers, in fact, they, 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 had, they felt that they had to work harder in, in, in the homes because they were, they were the individuals that were re responsible for cleaning. So they become very obsessive because many people very, very conscious about the risk of, uh, of environment contamination. So they had their workers work endlessly to clean up the places. Uh, there was also less protection from government policies. So as you know that the, they had to go into quarantines, 
uh, in terms of uh, sites, but then they had to find their own places. And of course, when in their own, own domestic settings, uh, the, the, um, where they were working, a lot of times the space was limited. There was a much higher risk of depression, anxiety, and socially deprived, 27% uh, compared to nine in non-deprived. -de uh, there were also worse subjective feeling in social uh, deprived in terms of happiness, worth, worthiness of life, and life satisfaction. Greater increase in stress since the outbreak in the less educated. The, the civil society, which uh, as our vice chancellor was saying, was very important in terms of doing some of the mitigation measures. Uh, the, they and the charity center provided great social assistance to the less advantaged during pandemic. The personal protection equipped support was provided by the Hong Kong Council Social Service, along with 350 social welfare organizations. Community health education, psychological support was provided by uh, Hong Kong Radio. Obviously many of them uh, did a lot of this work. I'm just giving examples. So we have nutritious food packs for large persons by St. James. And of course, Hong Kong Jockeys Club, which is the biggest charity this cross, provided over $987 million for a broad range of community support services in collaboration with many of the uh, NGOs, social in the social health care sectors and with uh, uh, academia. In summary, uh, in recommendations, so Hong Kong, as you know, has the longest life expectancy in the world but also their marked health inequalities. COVID-19 has exposed and exacerbated pre-existing social inequalities in Hong Kong, not only due to the disproportionate risks and effect of, of the infection, but the differential health and social impacts of COVID-19 containing measures across the social ladder. Reducing inequalities in health, as the Vice Chancellor was saying, requires holistic strategies across the whole of society. And of course, importantly, also the whole, across the whole of government sectors rather than mitigation in silos. To review the impact of COVID-19 and continued measures on physical and mental health, different social groups, including children, working adults, foreign domestic workers, and migrant populations, requires analysis of the impact of policy on health equity in future policies. And of course, then measures to tackle the pandemic in preparedness plans in the future. So in our Institute, our mission is to examine and understand issues of health equity in Hong Kong, and to build capacity of relevant stakeholders and to serve as a platform for better research, understanding, and networking. And of course, all this is to inform government policies and intervention programs uh, to reduce this uh, health to to reduce the health inequity in Hong Kong. And of course, we are also are establishing a network for the Asian region to foster knowledge exchange and capacity region development across the region. Thank you. So due to the time, we now um, go for the Q&A session. Um, and because there's, I, I heard there's a, going to be a class after this, right? It's right here at this venue. So we're going to collect maybe three burning questions that we would like to ask Sir Michael or um, Professor E.K. Yo. Um, so we'll go around and to collect the, 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 the question first. And also the audience, uh, from Zoom, we're going to uh, look at the questions that you leave in the Q&A or the chat um, uh, room uh, in a bit. So we will take the questions from the floor first. Thank you. Okay, so this is from an online attendee. The question is, um, dear Professor Marmot, what is your biggest challenge in advocating for health equality? That's a very good question. Yeah, um, going back to the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, which I chaired, uh, we called our report Closing the Gap in a Generation. And I said at the time that it was a statement that we had the knowledge to close the gap in a generation. We had the means to close the gap in a generation. There's a lot of money sloshing about the world. The question is, do we have the will? And the biggest challenge is not the knowledge, it's not the means, it's the will, the political will of the politicians who govern us, but of the population. And that's the biggest challenge, uh, actually getting the political will to put health equity front and central. 
Thank you very much. Any other questions uh, from the Zoom audience or our live audience? Okay, the questions do not have to be burning, but it could be any <laughs> questions. Okay, our VC, please, <laughs> Professor Tuan. Thanks, uh, Michael, for a great talk and uh, really wish to see you in person as soon as yeah. Uh, my question uh, actually addressed to both uh, Michael and uh, EK as well. Uh, how does culture, uh, meaning cultural background or cultural specificities, practices and whatnot, factor into the um, social determinants? Um, you, you listed wealth, you listed uh, obviously working conditions, education and so forth. Uh, how does culture factor into this? And then, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, firstly, firstly, Rocky, I would be delighted to be there in person. I look forward to <laughs> greeting you in person and my good colleagues at the Institute of Health Equity. Uh, this is okay, but it's not as good as the real thing. Um, it's a very important question. When we were doing the American um, Commission in the Americas, and my First Nations colleagues from Canada said, you don't understand the position of First Nations. I said, yeah, I do. I've got a model, you know, that I've got this model about early childhood. And they said, what you're missing out is relationship to the land, what it means to us as a people to have our relationship to the land. Well, another word for that is culture. And uh, if you violate people's cultures, uh, you damage their likelihood of having good health. And when we look in Britain now at ethnic differences, some of that is culture. I mean, for example, there was a report recently from the House of Commons on education. And it pointed out that poor white kids were doing poorly in education. What they didn't say was that poor Bangladeshi kids were doing well. Rather than say, well, look, the white kids are doing badly, why not pay attention to the fact that the Bangladeshi kids, despite the poverty, were doing well? Now, one way of describing that is culture, which is something in addition or separate or tangential to socioeconomic circumstances. Um, so culture is absolutely vital. And we miss it. If we miss it out, we're doing something that terribly wrong. Yes. Thank you very much, Sir Michael. Uh, and I, as, as Michael has uh, very mentioned about culture, because it's also culture of people accepting their, their own positions in life. So it's so like uh, the, the, uh, the story that uh, Sir Michael talked about, people just accept their positions. So they, they, that would be a, a self-fulfilling pro prophecy. So I think that's a very important aspect. There's one question relating to, uh, uh, relating to uh, primary care in Hong Kong, which is uh, the question is asked, how can primary care help to deal with this health inequality? So that's mm. absolutely something which is very important. In fact, in, on my other side of my work in health, we are we're producing a report uh, which will be launched in the end of December, so in a month, on, on primary care and then how we can uh, strategically purchase primary care for Hong Kong. Because mm -hmm. I say it's one of the key elements of improving uh, uh, health quality in, in Hong Kong. So, that, so we'll be inviting you to that meeting. And the other, the other thing I'd like to contribute is also in terms of the, uh, the political will that Sir Michael talked about. In Hong Kong, we have a lot of policies that comes trying to do to help improve uh, uh, circumstances with, for disadvantage, but very often it's not very um, uh, targeted, it's not, uh, the, it's not very um, coordinated, and then it's not evaluated in terms of the impact. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of programs, so it will be part of the work that the Institute will be doing, reviewing a lot of the policies and the impact on uh, health quality. So, so that's the thing that we're going to work on in the future reports. Thank you very much, Professor Yeo, and we certainly look forward to reading your new report on primary 
care and especially the press, I'm sure they will be interested too. So here's a last question from the live audience. Um, dear Sir Michael, thank you very much for your book and lecture. I noticed that you regard life expectancy as one standard to evaluate the living quality. And I'm very curious about the connection between the two. Could you please explain more? And are there any other standards you employ to evaluate the happiness of people? Thank you. Yeah, my, my argument that life expectancy, well, firstly, it's health that concerns me. We use life expectancy because it's readily available. It's collected, it's reported for all countries. It's available. We can look at it over time. So it's not, and you notice when I was showing you the English data, I had healthy life expectancy as well, which is more important. Uh, it's just not as readily available for comparison, but it's a much better measure, um, healthy life expectancy, quality of life. Yeah. Happiness is not the same thing. They tend to correlate, um, but they're not identical. So for example, um, if you compare Japan with the United States, um, I don't know figures, but you may have them and we should get them for Hong Kong. But if you compare Japan with the United States, Japan has longer life expectancy than the United States, narrow inequalities, lower crime rates, less social isolation for elderly people. Um, in about every social measure I can think of, Japan looks better than the United States, except one, happiness. <laughs> The Americans are deliriously happy. God knows why, given the problems they have. Um, but they're happy all the time. At least that's what they tell researchers. And the Japanese would never admit to being happy. That's not part of the culture. It comes back to Rocky's question about culture. So in every measure I can think of, the Japanese look better than the US, except happiness. So happiness is tapping into something different. Uh, there are obviously big cultural dimensions to it. Um, and in a way, that's why I prefer health as my measure of social success than happiness, uh, because it's something we all value, and we probably pretty well all value in all countries and cultures. Most people prefer to be alive than dead. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for the very insightful, very inspiring talks from both Professor Yo and also from Sir Michael. Please give a big hand to both of them. Again, we would love to have you here physically. Um, I think it will happen at some point. Um, so now I would like to give the time back to our MC uh, from CEO Press, and it has been my pleasure to serve as the moderator for today's talk. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Professor Mahmoud, Professor Yeo, Professor Chung, for bringing this engaging discussion to us. And thank you, everyone, uh, for participating in today, all of you here, and also the uh, more than 90 guests we have online attending through Zoom and Facebook. Before we end, may I bring your attention once again to Professor Mahmoud's work. It is available on the counter outside the lecture room uh, with the special e-sign card uh, by Professor Mahmoud. I hope you would enjoy the book. Thank you and have a nice day.